This video is about power, and the purpose of this video is to make up for some of the lost class time that we're not going to be able to have in class, and also go over what happens when we change various aspects of a problem and see how that influ influences power. So first off, let's remind ourselves of the definition of what power is. Power is the probability that we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually false. So it's a probability of a correct rejection. And so if we were to think about this in terms of like a court of law, it's the probability of convicting the person who really committed the crime. But no matter what, power is always about probability. Right? So power is a good thing. We want to make the right decision in a hypothesis test, but because we don't know what the real situation is, we don't know the true mean, we don't know the true proportion, we never know if we've made that correct decision. So all we can do is talk about the probability that we've made that correct decision. We would like to think of setting this up in terms of two steps. So when do I reject HO? So that's our first step here. When do we reject the null hypothesis? So when does my sample statistic or what does my sample statistic have to be for me to reject? So if I'm doing a right tail test, how big does my mean have to be? How big does my p hat have to be for me to finally be convinced statistically that the hypothesized value is wrong? And then once I've established that, um, and then I can say, well, what chance do I have of getting a value like that value that I found in problem, uh, that step one, if the null is really false, that is, if the alternative is true. So step one is saying, find our cutoff. And step two says, use that cutoff to find a probability. So it's really finding a probability in two parts. So consider Kramer. So all the examples are the examples that are worked out in the notes. So Kramer has 600 tightless golf balls that he hits out into the ocean. His previous average was known to be 185 yards with a known standard deviation of 5 yards. You want to test whether he is better with the tightless balls than before at the .05 lever. Uh, level. If the true average distance for Kramer with tightless balls is 193 yards, what's the power of this test? So this is asking what is the probability we correctly say his average is not 185. So if Kramer really is averaging more than 185 yards, and specifically that he is averaging 193 yards, what's the probability that we reject our null hypothesis? That is what we're asking when we say what's the power of this test. So let's write down what we have. His previous average, that's our null hypothesis, was 185. And we want to know whether he is better, so that's our alternative is that mu is greater than 185. So we still write our null and alternative hypotheses because we need to know where to look for that cutoff value in step one. So this greater than is important to us. We also know that we have a known standard deviation of five yards. So sigma is our population standard deviation and this is known to be five yards. And remember like we talked about in class, we like to be able to make that assumption here that the true population standard deviation is known because that means that we can use a z distribution. And we are using alpha equals 0.05. So the first thing is to find step one. What mean in our sample will cause us to reject the null hypothesis? So here we've got Kramer, his previously averaged 185 yards without tightless golf balls. 
and we know that we have to average above 185 yards in order to reject the null hypothesis with a sample of size 600. So we're going to have to average something up here to get a p-value of less than 0.05. So we're looking in the right tail because we have a right tail test. This is from our alternative. So what is this value? What x bar has alpha equals 0 0.05 above it? When do I reject this null hypothesis? When do I have enough evidence to say 185 yards is not believable? Well, usually we say z equals x bar minus mu over sigma over the square root of n. But we can find this z. We know mu, this is going to be our mu naught, because we have this 185 right here. We know sigma, this is known, and we know n. This is our 600. So this z I said we can find, this comes from the table. This is a z with 0 0.05 probability above it. So once we have these values, we can get that sample mean that is our cutoff. Any sample mean greater than this value will cause us to reject. So from the normal table, we want a z with alpha probability above it, or 0.05 probability above it, because it's a right-tailed test. In our notation, we always write our left tail probability as our subscript. So we want z with 1 minus alpha to the left of it, or z of 0.95. And if we go to the table, that would be 1.645. Or we could get this value from jump as well. So this is from jump or the table. So this means that I need an observation that is 1.645 standard deviations above my hypothesized value in order to reject. Well, what is that in terms of my, you know, Kramer's actual yardage in terms of his hitting? Well, we convert. So we have our z equals x bar minus mu naught divided by sigma over the square root of n. And we solve this for x bar. So we have x bar equals z, 1 minus alpha, times sigma over the square root of n, plus mu naught. I've just solved for x bar. So this is going to be my cutoff. Any x bar bigger than this, in this case, is going to be too big. I'm going to say, I don't believe that 185 yards is Kramer's, too average. It's Kramer's true average if he is averaging this much in this sample. So this is our cutoff value to reject the null. So we plug in. We get 1.645 times 5 over the square root of 600 plus 185. So our minimum value, the minimum distance Kramer has to hit for us to reject the null hypothesis is 185.336 yards. That means that Kramer doesn't actually have to average very much farther than one foot higher than his previous average when he's hitting 600 golf balls. So to reject this null hypothesis, Kramer has to average 185 and one-third yards with this sample of size 600. So that's our first step. The next step then is to find our probability. So now step two is find the probability that Kramer averages over 185.336 yards with his sample of 600 golf balls. Now he has to do this, and we're looking at the greater than because of that right-tailed alternative, and we're doing this assuming that now the null hypothesis is false. So step one was to reject the null hypothesis, 
or to find the value that we needed to reject the null hypothesis, and now we're saying the null hypothesis is false and start with that assumption. So we write that as a probability statement that x bar is greater than this mean, 185.336, given the null hypothesis is false, or given HO is false. So that's our starting point. So we've just translated that sentence into a probability statement. Now, when is the null hypothesis is false? We've got our rule for rejecting. We need a sample average greater than 185.336 yards, but we've got to figure out what does that mean? Right now it's just floating out there in space. Is it, do we have to get a sample average greater than 185, you know, for what situation? Well, we know that in the alternative world that Kramer is really averaging 193 yards. So that's what we're going to use for this rule. So the null hypothesis is false when he's averaging 193 yards. And now we can find z-scores and we can find probabilities. So we know how to do a probability that x bar is greater than some value when we have that z-score. So now we just set that up the way we always do. So it's the probability that x bar is greater than 185.336 given that that true mean that we'll use to center and find z-scores is 193. So we just set up our steps the same way we always do at this point. We'll convert this to a z-score and we'll find our probabilities from there. Remembering now that we have determined that the null hypothesis is completely false, we're going to work on the assumption that the alternative is true or that that true mean is 193. So we can draw our curve. We know we need a value greater than 185.336 if the mean is 193. So that's going to look like this. We're going to shade in all of that region above 185.336 on a curve with a mean of 193 and we know how to find this, so we'll find our z-scores. So what is the z-score for an x-bar of 185.336 from a distribution with a mean of 193, if that is in fact that true mean? And we do that by finding a z-score the same way we do anything. Once we have our same mean and our x-bar, we do x-bar minus that alternative mean, that mu a, divided by sigma over the square root of n. So again, we call that mu a our alternative mean. That's the alternative to the hypothesized value. We need something to center it on. So this x-bar minus mu a over sigma over square root of n, that's a z. And we're going to see the probability we get a z greater than a z score of 185.336 minus 193 over 5 over the square root of 600. So we've got a z random variable greater than a specific value. And this is in the framework, this is the notation that we've seen before. So this is the probability that we get a z greater than that specific z score of negative 37.547, which is a hugely negative z-score. It is beyond off the charts. The probability that we get a z greater than a value that negative is approximately equal to 1. Almost the entire z distribution is going to be greater than that value. So we are going to have very high power. If we were to try to find this value in the z chart, it wouldn't be there. And if we were to plug in this z score into jump calculator, we would have a power given to us of 1. So this is a probability of approximately equal to 1. It is not exactly equal to 1. There are a lot of 9's preceding this value, but it is very practically close to 1. Graphically, in this situation, what we have looks like this. On the right hand side we have our alternative mean at 193, which is the blue curve centered there, and on the left hand curve that is our null distribution which is actually centered at 185. So the distance between these two curves is only 8 yards that vertical line is marked at 185.336.
So again, Kramer only had to average one foot or one third of a yard better using those 600 golf balls for us to reject. And the reason why we had power of approximately one is because nearly 100% or that entire curve on the right is shaded in. If we were to sample, a sample means from that blue curve, nearly all of them would be greater than 185.336. These two curves are very distinct, and that's because the standard error of x bar is sigma over the square root of 600. We have a huge sample size. When we have a small standard error, we have very narrow, very tiny, tightly distributed distributions, and that makes it easy to detect differences, even a difference of only 8 yards. Another way to interpret this high power value is that if we were to sample 600 golf balls or if Kramer were to hit 600 golf balls repeatedly, nearly 100% of those sample averages, if the true mean were 193 yards, would be greater than 180. 5.336 yards. So let's consider this next problem. What if Kramer only had 16 golf balls and nothing else changed? Well, the mean would still be 185 for our null, and our alternative is still that the mean is greater than 185. So here, our alternative mean is still 193, so that hasn't changed. What has changed is the standard error. Because we have a different sample size, although it's still sigma over square root of n, that would now be 5 over the square root of 16, because we only have 16 golf balls. So that means we're going to have a different x bar that we need to obtain to reject that null hypothesis. So we have to redo part 1. So our alternative is the same, our null hypothesis is the same, but our first question, what x bar do we need to obtain to reject that null hypothesis? We have to answer that again, but we answer it in the same way. We still use z1 minus alpha equals 1.645 because alpha is unchanged. And so x bar equals z1 minus alpha times sigma over square root of n plus mu naught but now that sigma over square root of n is 5 over the square root of 16, so we have a much bigger standard error than we had before because we have a much smaller sample size. So that division by that smaller sample gives us a much wider standard error, a much wider uh, uh, sample standard deviation for our sampling distribution. So we're going to have a very different x bar that we need to re need to reject our null hypothesis. And sure enough, when we figure this out, we get an x bar to reject of 187.05. So that means that before, while Kramer only had to average a one foot farther uh, in order to reject the null hypothesis, this smaller sample size or this bigger standard error means Kramer has to hit two yards farther on average in order for us to really detect a difference in order for us to reject the null hypothesis. And again, this has nothing to do with the alternative mean. It has everything to do with the size of that standard error. So this x bar means that we have to average more than 187 yards to reject the null hypothesis. So that is our step one. So how do we do this? When, when do we reject? Or what's the probability we reject? That's step two. So the probability that we get an x bar greater than 187 yards, um, or 187.056 yards, that has to be found if the null hypothesis is false or if the null hypothesis is wrong. And specifically wrong in this case still if the mean is really 193.
So we set up our probability statement. It's a probability that x bar is greater than 187.056 yards if the null is false, if he really averages 193 yards with the tight list. And again, the only difference is that we've decreased our sample size by a lot. So we now just find this z score. So we've got over here on the right, if the true mean is really 193 yards, if we're really under this pink curve, what's the probability that we get something greater than this 187 than this vertical line? And we can see that it's probably going to be very big because almost the entirety of that pink curve is above that. So this null curve is entirely wrong. We're disregarding it. We have entirely changed focus to the curve with 193 as its mean. So what's the z-score for 187 when 193 is the mean? And we know how to do that. So that's x bar minus mu a over sigma over square root of n. So this is a z random variable. And we want to find the probability that that random variable is greater than a z-score of 187.056 minus 193 over 5 over the square root of 16. And that is our z-score. So working this out, this is the probability that we get a z random variable greater than negative 4.755. And even though this is still pretty much off the chart, we can see that this is a lot closer to zero, or it's a much more reasonable z-score than that negative 37 we had before. And again, all that change was our sample size. So this is still big, still off the charts, but we can find this. If we plug this into jump, we're going to get a non 100% probability. So when we do this, the probability that we get a z greater than negative 4.755 is 0.9999683. So still very close to 1, but it's not 100%. So let's consider this next example. What if Kramer had 16 golf balls and his true average or tight list were 189 yards? So we still have n equals 16, if we're but if we're looking at instead an alternative mean of 189. So our null hypothesis is mu equals 185, and our alternative is that mu is greater than 185, but specifically we think that maybe the mean is 189. So we still write our null and alternative as equals to and greater than, but we have in the back of our head, what if that true mean is 189 instead? So our standard error is 5 over the square root of 16, so that is not changed from the previous problem. So when we try to find, using alpha equals 0.05, that the value, that x bar that we need to reject. So when we ask what x bar do we need to reject the null hypothesis, that's not going to change because we still have that same standard error. The sample size is the same. The standard deviation is the same. The null is the same. So that's all going to be everything we just did in the previous problem. And to demonstrate that, we have x bar equals z, 1 minus alpha, times sigma over square root of n, plus mu naught. So because everything is just based on z, sigma over square root of n, and mu naught, as long as those are the same, as long as those are unchanged, you'll get that same one x bar from the previous problem. So we still just need to get a sample average greater than 187.056. Kramer just needs to do two yards better than before with the tightless balls in order to reject that null hypothesis. So down here in the right hand corner we have our graph and that vertical line is still that 187. We still have to do better than that. The yellow curve on the right, that's our alternative mean. So they're centered on our alternative mean. And on the left, that's our null mean. So that's still that 185. So we have to get a sample average greater than 187.056 to reject. And so where that null dis or that alternative distribution that's centered on 189 is greater than that, that's our reject, that's our power. So power is that 
Step two, the probability that we get an x bar greater than 187.056 when the null is false or when that true mean is really 189. So that's the probability we get an x bar minus mu a over the sigma over square root of n greater than, and here's where we get our z score under the alternative value. So 187.056 minus 189 over sigma over the square root of n. So this is not a very big difference. 187 minus 189, that's not going to give us a very high z-score. This is going to be a closer to zero z-score. So we can see that that overlap is getting more and more. So before we were looking at a difference of eight yards, now we're looking at a difference of two yards between our null and alternative values. So when we solve for our z-score, we get the probability that z is greater than negative 1.55, and that's going to be a smaller probability than the one we found before. So this is going to give us a power or a probability of 0 0.9406. That 0 0.9406 is this shaded in region under the yellow curve. Remember, that null hypothesis is wrong is incorrect, so that whole curve is gone. We're just interested in if this alternative is true, if this 189 is the true mean, what is the probability that we were to get a sample mean if we have 16 golf balls that is above 187.056? when we have a standard error of 5 over the square root of 16. So this is just about z-scores. So we're saying we have a population with an average of 193. We have a sample of size 16. We're just looking for pulling sample means from that population when we have a sample of size 16. So 94% of the time, we will get sample means that are greater than 187. So it's still most of the time, we still have high power. So consider what we've done here. We went from 193 to 189 yards. So we compared a difference between 8 yards to 4 yards. We've halved the difference, and so we lost some power. It's harder to tell, it's harder to catch a difference when you have, or it's harder to reject the null hypothesis when the distinction is smaller. So when you mu a minus mu naught decreases, power decreases. So what if Kramer had 16 golf balls, so the sample size is the same, and the true average with tightless were 186 yards? So we just saw that when that difference between mu a and mu naught decreases, power decreases, so we should lose even more power now. So mu a is now 186 yards. So our null hypothesis is still that we have 185 yards from before, but our, and our alternative is still that the average is 100 is greater than 185, but now that alternative is only one yard higher. So the first question, what x bar do we need or does Kramer need to average in order to reject that null hypothesis? And again, the null hasn't changed, our sample size hasn't changed, and our, our significance level hasn't changed. So x bar equals z1 minus alpha times sigma over square root of n plus mu naught is still going to be 187.056. But if Kramer is really averaging 186 yards, it's going to be hard for him to average more than 187 yards from that distribution. To pull a sample average of greater than 187 yards, very often, if its true mean is 186 yards, is going to be difficult. So that should be reflected in our probability. So let's find that out. So the probability that Kramer averages greater than 187.056 yards, given the null hypothesis is false, specifically when the null when the mean is really 186 yards, well, we set that up the same way we always do. That's the the probability of x bar minus mu a over sigma over square root of n is greater than 187.056.
minus 186, that alternative mean, divided by 5 over the square root of 16, which is our square root of n. So that's the probability that we get a z greater than 0 0.845. This is a positive z-score now, and so we're going to get a probability that is less than 0.5. So again, because we have to find a probability of something that is greater than our current population average, this is going to be difficult to do. It's going to be hard for Kramer to average that very often. And sure enough, our p probability, our power is 0.1977. Now let's consider this final example. What if the true mean with Titleist were 186 yards and Kramer had those 600 golf balls he started with? So our null hypothesis is that the mean is 185 and the alternative is that the mean is greater than 185. And again, the alternative is that he specifically has 186 golf balls, so we're still interested in that one yard difference but he has 600 golf balls, so his sample size has shot way back up to 600. So that means our standard error is going to decrease, so we're going to have quite a bit more distinction. So question one is what x bar or sample mean do we need in order to reject the null hypothesis? So this is that same x bar that we had in that first problem. So x bar equals z1 minus alpha times sigma over the square root of n plus mu naught. And so that's going to be 185.336. So as it has been all along, the z1 minus alpha is 1.645, our sigma over square root of n is now 5 over the square root of 600, and mu naught is still 185. This has been unchanged. So when you plug these in, you can get this x bar that we need to reject, that cutoff value for Kramer. So this is his minimum sample mean he needs in order to say, you know what, I'm doing better than 185 on average with these tight list balls. So what's the probability that we are able to reject that null hypothesis? What's the probability that we get something higher than that sample mean that he needs if he really is averaging 186 yards with Titleist? Well, we set that up. The probability that x bar is greater than 186 if the null hypothesis is false when he's really averaging 186 and that would make the null false. So it's the probability that x bar minus mu a over sigma over the square root of n over that standard error. So this is again setting up that z uh, standard distribution, that z distribution, our standardized distribution. And then we find our z score, that 185.386 minus 186 under the alternative distribution. So that's over 5 over square root of 600. So that's the probability we get a z greater than negative 3.254. So this is a very negative z score, but it's not the most negative one we've seen before. So it's going to have a pretty high probability, but it's not going to be certain. We're not going to have 100% power. So we find this from the z table. And we find that the probability that we reject this null hypothesis when it is actually false to be 0 0.9994. So 99.94% of the sample means are from the sample averages that come from a distribution with an average of 186 when there are 600 golf balls will be greater than 185.336. So 99% of the sample averages that we obtain will be big enough to reject the null hypothesis, will be greater than this vertical line. So even though we're only looking for a one yard improvement in Kramer's golf driving game, because he has 600 golf balls, we're actually going to be able to detect that improvement or reject that null hypothesis with some ease. He had one yard improvement in the previous example, but with only 16 golf balls, there was almost no distinction. Now we have high distinction and we'll be able to reject that null hypothesis 99% of the time.